God's grace, his mercy, and his peace are yours in abundance. And so we sing along with God's people of the Old Testament, Amen, Amen. This morning we want to focus on the gospel lesson that we have before us in Luke chapter 4. Uh, let us uh, begin with the word of prayer. O Lord, bless us today as we gather around your word. Comfort our hearts, encourage our hearts, and equip us for lives of service to you, that many more might be led to see you as the Anointed One, the Savior of the world, who has provided eternal life for all of us. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Wouldn't it be great if, uh, from a year from now, next January, we would all witness the inauguration of the best president ever in the history of the United States? And might I say, the perfect person for the job. Well, maybe to sort of demonstrate the odds of that actually happening, maybe we can kind of do sort of an experiment, and a very unscientific experiment. But I want you to think of a number between 1 and 100. I already have a number in my head, what, what's the number, but pick a number. Ready? 63. Who's closest to 63. 44? 59. 59? Anyone closer? 59? 65? Greg was? Okay. All right. So, Greg, stand up. You're the one in charge. <laughs> right? And if you're going to be the one in charge, because it's, this is the odds, right? You're going to be the best person for the job. You have to listen to us. You have to make sure that everyone's content and maybe even happy. You have to assure us that we're going to be safe. We're not going to have any more problems. Everything is going to be fine. You have to be able to deal with all the pressure, and you're going to have to be ready to make decisions just like that. I 25. 25. Oh. <laughs> well, that's the odds, right? Being 65, 25. Right. So, Greg, how confident would you be that you would be the man for the job? Right. Thankfully, he shook his head no. And if I were to ask all of you, I think you would agree the same, being nice to Greg, but we recognize that there is no perfect person for the job, the one being in charge. You can understand then the excitement of the people that day as Jesus of Nazareth comes into the synagogue, in his hometown synagogue, and he's going to stand up to read from the scriptures. This is the guy who had taken 120 gallons of water and turned it into 100 gallons of wine. You can understand the excitement of these people, and you can understand the fame. Right? It sort of spread like wildfire that there is a special guy coming out of Nazareth who seems to be maybe the one who's going to save us. You can understand that because you're just as helpless as those people were. You and I are just like those people whose best efforts always fell far short of meeting their needs and taking care of their problems. Even the most confident people were oftentimes nervous and concerned. Even the leaders in the city, they were always searching for someone who really could be in charge and who really would take care of their problems. You can understand then the anticipation of that day as it was growing, as Jesus stood up to read from the scriptures. No one was surprised that he got up to read. That was sort of a custom of the day. You see, in Jerusalem, it was the priests who would carry out worship and would read from the scriptures. In the local synagogue, the local church, uh, it was the laymen who would stand up to read. People who were uh, seen as the leaders. And, and eventually, the best and the brightest of the laymen would actually might become the teachers or the rabbis. The word on the street was that Jesus was one of the best and brightest, maybe a little too good for the job. And so there was excitement as he was going to stand up. People had started to listen to him, and not just in Nazareth, all over the countryside. They knew something was special about this, this man from Nazareth. It was sort of this buzz in the air, right, in that spring day as Jesus stood up to talk. Were the older men sort of proud about 
look at this young lad who's come from our town. Were the young men sort of jealous of what Jesus was able to do? And maybe even there were some women sort of looking around the corner, a little bit curious as to who this man or what Jesus had become as a young man. But why this curiosity? Why this sense of hope? Because hope had been waning in the history of the Israelites for hundreds of years. Going all the way back to the Babylonians, going back to Alexander the Great. And at the current time, there was that iron fist of King Herod. His inf- he was infamous for his cruelty. He was known to have even killed his own sons in order to retain power uh, on his throne. And above Herod was the Roman Empire. We learn of how they would line the roads leading out of Rome with crosses to crucify the infidels, sometimes leaving them up for months to make an impression, to, to rule with that iron fist, to invoke obedience through fear. But even within the church, their world was a mess. Things were only getting worse. The leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, didn't have their spiritual care in mind. The Pharisees, they just liked to follow all the laws and puff themselves up and putting other people down to make themselves feel a little better. And the Sadducees, they loved to mix politics and religion in order to keep on the good side of the Romans, maybe to fill their pockets and kind of keep things safe. But even among the common people, the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poor. And that caused its own problems. The, the, the perfect storm of events and circumstances had been brewing for years. But there seemed to be no hope. Right? No Savior, no Messiah, no promised one from God who was going to take care of them. That is, until now. Enter Jesus. There was something different about this prophet who had come from Nazareth. There was something special about the way that he talked. There was something special of of the the effect that his words had on people. As scripture tells us, everyone agreed he spoke as one with authority. People just listened to him. He he grabbed attention. Um, It made the Pharisees and the Sadducees sort of irate, just bugged them to no end that they, the people stopped listening to them and were listening to Jesus. On the other hand, though, the, the fishermen and the farmers, the, the businessmen, the city workers, they were ecstatic. Because when Jesus spoke, things happened. What made Jesus' ministry tour, his preaching tour, so special is he wasn't like someone who was campaigning for office or trying to climb the corporate ladder. He wasn't there to tell people what they wanted to hear in order to get their support and their vote. People sensed, and they knew that with Jesus, it wasn't about himself. If he happened to stop along the way and maybe pick up a baby and kiss the baby or, or bless the children, he meant it. Or if he's walking along the way and someone's cart had fallen over, he stopped to help them from the bottom of his heart, not worrying about cameras watching him. And when he spoke, he didn't just touch people's ears, he touched their souls and comforted and confirmed them with his powerful words of forgiveness. As Jesus healed people, he more importantly soothed their souls with something they really couldn't explain but just felt it and enjoyed and and were amazed at the peace that they had through forgiveness, knowing that their creator was still going to love them. Many people, when they walked away from a sermon of Jesus, they walked away not just healed, but they walked away with their lives changed forever. It was just like God had promised through the prophet Isaiah. So as the people thought about their problems and their struggles in life, who better to be in charge than the one who could change the molecular structure of water and turn it into wine? Or the one who is able to gather or cause hundreds of fish to gather into the nets of Peter, James, and John? Who better to be in charge than the one who simply said things 
and people were healed and people were raised from the dead. A viable solution, I would agree, for a world filled with mess. And it's the same world that you and I have to deal with. Living in this world, this messy world, we constantly search for someone to be in charge who can actually help us and take care of us. We constantly look around us for other people. or We look in the mirror for help. But we always come to the same conclusion. We think we're in charge. We're, we think we're in control of our thoughts and our actions. We think we can control the temptations around us or the evil around us. But the evidence leads us back to one conclusion. That we aren't in charge, that we aren't in control, that we continue to make the same mistakes and we fall into the same sinful traps. Desperate, we have nowhere to turn, but what a joy that the Holy Spirit leads us to look to the one who is in charge, the anointed one. Right? When, peop- when Jesus spoke, people listened. When, when Jesus commanded things, they happened. As we read here, the eyes were glued to Jesus. They just couldn't stop listening and watching. Their hearts were yearning for what he had to offer. And what was it? Good news. The good news that he had stepped into our world to take control and to be in charge. And he did that by becoming the punishment that has brought you and me peace. As he hung there on the cross, as he finished that work of our God, he turned to his people and he provided for us that wonderful assurance of life everlasting. So now, when we deal with a messy world and we realize and recognize how, uh, uh, how messy this world is, Jesus turns to us with his words and he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. When we're bullied and we're beaten up with guilt and shame, when we're bombarded by temptations and the attacks of the devil around us, Jesus steps into our lives through his word. He takes charge and he leads us to confess with the Apostle Paul, yes, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Jesus staked the claim of being the anointed one in our gospel lesson this morning. And by doing so, he declared to the world that he was the one in charge. And by his miracles and by his powerful words, he had given people that sense of certain assurance things were going to work out. For hundreds of years, God's people had been waiting for him to carry through on his promise. And so you can understand the excitement as Jesus stood up that day and he opened the scrolls of scriptures and he said, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Just what the people needed. People still today constantly search for someone who really is in charge. They want that sense of comfort and encouragement that there is someone who is in charge of their life and is going to take care of things. They want someone who's going to step in and fix all their problems. They want someone who's going to listen to them. They want someone in charge who is going to focus all their attention on what they need and care for what's going on in their world. Well, that's why you and I gather today in God's house, this synagogue, we might say, and and we open the scrolls of scriptures. And why do we do that? Because when we look in scriptures, we find the one who really is in charge. And so we celebrate, we, we sing our hymns to our God, our praises, we bring, we present our offerings to the one in charge because we're so thankful for what he has done for us and what he will continue to do for us. 
Now, it doesn't mean that there's going to be an end to world hunger. There's always going to be terrorism, uh, deception among nations. Uh, There's never going to be uh, the perfect person for the job of uh, the president. And people on both sides of the political aisle are always going to disagree. But what brings you and me comfort and hope and joy is the certainty of knowing the one who really is in charge. That he has released us from the guilt of shame, uh, released us from guilt and shame. He's, He's delivered us from the power of death as he rose from the grave. And now, as we live in this world, as we look around us, we see people who are still looking for someone who really is in charge you and I continue to offer the prayer that we offered earlier in the prayer of the day. Anoint us, Lord, with the power of your spirit that we too may bring good news to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, and proclaim liberty to the captive. What a joy, what a blessing. Each time you and I stand up or sit down together and we scroll open scriptures, we find the one who really is in charge. God bless us each time as we look to that one who's in charge. God bless us as we focus our time and our energy in this life, revealing that one to those in our lives that they also have the comfort and the joy of knowing who really is in charge. God grant us that in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand.